In a world where Africans have lost their roots, it has become of vital importance to document our ways. In an effort to reverse the brainwashing of the past, where we were made to believe our ways are demonic, we are pressed to create dignified and respectful platforms to unpack our spiritual ways. Umoya o light, umoya o bright. Welcome back to another episode of Moya. Thank you for all your love and support, guys. Thank you for liking, sharing, and subscribing. I see you guys. Thank you also for the things that you do for us that are on screen. We really, really appreciate it. And with you, we cannot have episodes. So today's episode, I was um, saying that I said to someone, okay, I'm going to have a white person on Moya today. And they were like, okay that shows diversity that's nice you're growing then i went yeah i'm having bianca van vague and they're like oh <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so you failed as a white person bianca <laughs> that part has been declined <laughs> rejected <laughs> Welcome to Moya. Thank you so Thank much you, for accepting Sydney. the invitation. Thank you for having me. You know, um, when I had to think about this episode, initially I thought I was going to have you on a panel, but then I realized that as a white South African, there's also a spiritual story and an impact that the politics of this country has had mm -hmm. on you as a person. So let's go to the beginning. When were you born? Where were you born? And what circumstances were surrounding you? Okay, so I was born a long time ago, half a century. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, in KZN. Okay. Um, my father uh, came from a very, uh, I would say, impoverished family. He was the eldest of 11 children. <laughs> I know. A lot. Um, and I don't know, a lot of that, I, I think that had a direct impact on the way I see the world. It mm. has always. Mm. I wasn't very involved in politics and things. I wasn't very aware. I mean, uh, if you had asked me about policy, I voted from 1994 when I could, uh, you know, when we had the, the changeover. Mm. And um, I always thought that I was on the right side of things. But then as I got older and I saw things and I actually, I think the major issue is in um, where I developed real black friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know mm -hmm. people say, mm -hmm. but I've got black friends. Yeah. But um, where we had open conversations and I started realizing, my goodness, I didn't know that. Mm. I really didn't think that way. I didn't, you know, actually address things from a perspective because, you know, you, you get a lot of, well-meaning white people in this country i think that really want things to they want us to all to just get along mm. but there's a lot of things that we need to address that we don't because we don't know and often because we're in a bubble of comfort we don't bother getting to know mm. you know because it doesn't really harm us mm. so when you want to shake us up there's nothing like you know, suggesting something like land reform to someone that has got no idea, well, they don't know the difference between private property and um, personal property. Uh, immediately they start thinking, oh, no, you're going to now come into my area, mm -hmm. shake up my area of comfort, and there's nothing that turns a well-meaning mm. white person into a more right-wing, mm. <laughs> into a white, <laughs> into a white white. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and yeah, so I was fortunate enough to actually be integrated into it through my friends that were open, quite patient. Which province were you born in? KZN. Then? Oh, you were in KZN. KZ I was born in Durban. Okay, cool. Yes. So you go to these multiracial schools and that's where you start well, interacting with black people or uh, what's happening? No, no, no. Uh -huh. From KZN, I went to a place called Ermelo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So my father um, worked at the power station. So we stayed also in a very secluded little um, area near the power station. It uh, was called Camden. And... Um, 
we we stayed there. It's, it was like these houses that Eskim provided at that stage for mm. people that worked mm. shifts. And then um, from there, my, I must highlight, I would say my father was very progressive for his time, but it was because he grew up in poverty. He wasn't an educated man, but he fully understood the the difference. He, I actually learned from my father about white privilege. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but he didn't use the word, you know, he didn't mm. use the term. He just explained, yes, that you get poor white people, but you get poor black people and it's two different poors. <laughs> You know, that was because he only had a standard six. <laughs> so, and that's how he explained it to me. But then at a stage, my mother married a well-off Afrikaans man. Okay. <laughs> and things changed. Um, I think a lot of what I experienced during that relationship of my mom's uh, opened my eyes up to the other side, okay, of of the world, totally different from my father. The, t the privilege, privilege. The privilege, privilege. But also it showed me how, well, it was actually my first real experience of blatant, cruel racism. Oh, yeah. that's what you mean. Yes. As a teenager, I actually saw that. I saw how, how uh, black people that were working for my stepfather, for instance, were treated as a teenager. And I don't know, because of my father, I always was very rebellious against it and um, kicked up a fuss. And I had my mom telling me, oh, come on, you know, this is how it works. And don't, don't mm. ruffle the feathers. But she ended up divorcing him anyway. <laughs> she was a serial <laughs> monogamist. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, so and that was Ermla. And then from there to um, Mokopane. <laughs> Okay. okay, and I went to uh, college in Polokwane, and from there I came to Gauteng and started working then in corporate. Um, okay, yeah. so now do you think that um, your experience with your stepfather is the one that started molding the activist? I think it did. It, well, the first thing it did was it molded the rebellion, you know, a rebel. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just, I watched not only what he was doing, but also what the woman in that situation, their reaction to that, the kind of look the other way, protect yourself, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. It's, and understanding there that your closeness to the, the male person being white is, the only way to do it is kind of provide a supportive role and empower them in their actions. And I had a problem with that, you know, so um, where I get along with my mother now as an adult, and I would, I would say that she is, oh, I would call her a white liberal, <laughs> okay. um, is that um, at that stage, I rebelled totally. I left uh, home at, what was I, 16, where I, I cut ties mm. with my mom at a stage because I just couldn't accept certain certain things. That that kind of submissiveness to a system that was harmful, you know. And um, and then it also opened my eyes up to how other people live and the silliness of things. I mean, I'm going to give you a, a, mm. a, this is such a s silly example. Okay, so we had a rather large house, mm. and there were two ladies that were working in this house. Okay. And they were allowed to wash the dishes, but they couldn't peel the potatoes, for instance, for a stew. Okay. Uh, make the beds, but couldn't drink out of the same, you know, and you grow up as a child seeing this. And when you start questioning it, it's just like, this is how we do things. Don't, you know, don't ruffle feathers. And no, you're just being rebellious at that stage. And... Yeah, and stage got sent to um, boarding school for my bad behavior, <laughs> for my rebellion. Mm -hmm. And yes, I was. I was a bit rebellious um, in a number of areas. I'm glad I didn't have a teenager like myself. <laughs> but but um, I'm glad that it wasn't beaten out of me totally. Mm -hmm. So so I took it through to adulthood. 
So then when you start meeting black people in school, mm. what's that interaction like as a white person? I can actually honestly tell you I never met black people in school. No ways. No. I never but There weren't black people in my school. Um, not in my primary school. Not in my – you must remember, um, so I was born in 1974, went to school, went to primary school in Ermelo, English primary school. There wasn't black people in my school. Um, went to a dual medium um, uh, technical high school. There weren't black people in my school. So so there was never uh, – there was uh, only 40 girls and 800 boys. I suppose that was something. So I learned to deal with boys <laughs> at that stage. But, yeah. There was never... Snap! I never met black people in school. So when do you now f encounter black people? When I went into the workplace. When I went into the workplace. Yeah. Even in... I can even remember in Technic College. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. Honestly, I didn't. I knew, for instance, Selena and I knew Linky that worked in our house. And then... Um, I started asking a lot of questions like, where's, he, where's Selena's children? Yes. And that was when I was still, you know, yeah. um, much younger. I was still in primary school. Mm. We, no, they they at home with her family. And, it, and, you know, at that stage as a child, you don't actually think, okay, but I'm with my family. Here's someone that's not with her family and only with her family during the holidays because it's not it was apparently far and i didn't know at that stage it meant like homeland far <laughs> kind of you know it was mm. that so so yeah i didn't meet black people in school i met uh, where i did though and that's that's also another thing is my uh, grandparents uh, on my mother's side had a farm and on that's where I met uh, black children, for instance. As we played, we swam together, we played together mm. and everything, you know, um, and there was no issue on the farm. That's interesting. Yeah, huh? it was like not a, not a big issue, but as smaller kids. Yeah. The moment you got a little bit older, that's, that changed totally. Um, then you wouldn't be having these, you, it was discouraged that you would have conversations or, you know, I used to remember, we used to be able to, as small kids, get on a track, on a tractor, um, with one of the farm workers, go to a field, spend the whole day picking cotton and playing. And, you know, as if, you know, we were playing while other people were I know, right? really working, you know, but then, you know, it's like great fun mm. and things like that. You, you don't apply your, your mind as mm. a child because you're not mm. awake to it. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't mm. wake your children up to it. And um, then as soon as you got a little bit older, you weren't allowed to do that, where you would say, yeah, I'm going to go down with um, Job to the – or with Isaac to, to the dam because he's going to go and switch the pump on. No, no, you're not. You know, so – and you never questioned it. It was just like – but now when I look back, <laughs> it's like – That's hectic, oh, eh? Okay. <laughs> so, Yeah. So doesn't it feel like a repetition? You were talking about how white women to survive um, have to support the the white man racism. Uh, yeah. Is this not what's playing out in the country then? I think, you know what, at a stage I thought about it. And, that, and also even with social media, I am, I used to, and I must say that that was kind of a strange bias, is that I often get... Um, one would say attacked. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think that's the best by by women, and I often by white mm. women, and then I would just ignore them because I just think, oh, you're already having a hard time, <laughs> you know. Mm. So, so I'm like, I would. But then I started realizing that we used to be supporting this, but we've become just just as. Um, mm. I would say we've become the perpetrators too. Mm. I, there's no innocence in that. I read a book a while ago. I think it was what um, Brown Scars, White Tears. And um, also another one mm. is on women that uh, in America, you see you don't get many of those books, yeah, but um, in America you, you, uh, there was about slavery, but it was about she owned me and it was about white women that owned slaves and it was passed on to them by their fathers. They were taught how to treat the slaves and they were actually in a lot of cases crueler 
than uh, their male ca counterparts. And I started realizing, you know what, no, we've probably become just as bad as the perpetrators. So it's kind of like if you learn about intersection intersectionality is that you realize it's, it's kind of the uh, oppressor oppressed class. So yes, we are women and yes, we have struggles with the, the patriarchy, but we also quickly have use our proximity to whiteness to, you know, to show Ooh. I'm in, I'm in power. Yeah. To be Karen. Yeah. Yes. I'm in power. Yeah. And also we are often used as weapons because white women's tears, for instance, where we've, we've had an experience and we just have to burst into tears. Um, we, we can be pretty dangerous. So, Quite. Yeah. And we know that we know that. Mm. Yeah. It's not something you can tell me you don't know because there's enough literature on it. There's enough examples of it. Um, and lived experience, lived experience where you actually have to mm. realize and you have to be conscious about it is, you know, when you in a situation is if I react this way, this is the impact it's going to have on everyone. Because I mean, I can't say I don't disagree with a man because he is a black man. Some and and we've had disagreements, you know, and I'm quite comfortable having disagreements mm. with with where I'll totally say no, this is this mm. is not true. This mm. is not okay. But I also know the impact that if I now have a total emotional reaction to this, mm. what is going to happen? in a situation like that. And you've got to be conscious about that. You've got to be conscious about your social capital and we, and use it, I would say, uh, wisely. How do we dismantle it so that white women don't feel that power? Uh, I, I have thought about it. Okay. So I can only talk about my own personal journey. And what I wanted to say is as I became conscious, I became freer because it was like, oh, that's why I reacted that way. And that's why I believed in those things. And the whole time you realize you're in a gilded cage with everything. The moment you tie yourself to whiteness, you haven't got this ability to see things from a different perspective because there is only one way to see it. And that way is a way that is going to support your the top of that hierarchy, which happens to be white men. Um, and it's not healthy for you. The moment you start realizing that you can actually free yourself and you can see things from a different perspective, I, it makes a huge impact. I can read an article, for instance, now, where I would have read an article previously and I think, oh, why would they do this, you know? And it will be about a, um, Let's say a it minister will be a, looting. I beg your pardon? A minister looting. <laughs> it will be about a minister yes. looting. Mm. And yeah, exactly. So you see this minister loot and you'll look at it and you'll say, oh, how could he? And everything. Mm. Oh, yeah, you see. See what happens. Mm. And now you read this article and then you read a similar article um, about, let's say, someone in the private um Mm, uh, sector. Looting. Loot, mm. looting but mm. No, no, but that's not looting. That mm. is, uh, what is it? Misappropriating mm. funds. <laughs> so, so there's different wording right. used. So, so you read that and you realize, and it's things that you've totally missed. Mm. You missed it before. Yes, he is involved in corruption. Let's deal with the corruption mm. issue, but let's, let's actually, let's mm. deal with the facts. Let's mm. not color it in a way of this is a, a cultural issue, mm. you know, that we're looking at here. So it's freeing. Intellectually, it's freeing. Conversations are easier. Um, yeah. When you speak about whiteness, the concept of whiteness, what are we speaking about? Okay. So for me, the concept of whiteness is how everything is tied to white supremacy. Okay. So it supports a certain system. And a lot of people don't understand that. They immediately, when they are whiteness, they are white. You're talking about me now. You're talking about Fricky or you're talking about Bianca. Mm. <laughs> so, and so when, for instance, let me, a very controversial statement is cut the throat of whiteness. We all saw that at a stage and people reacted in such a, you know, visceral way mm. because they don't understand the concept. So, so for me, it's, it's systems that are in place and people will say, look at the law now, the laws are, have changed and, you know, it's trying to, 
doesn't matter that those laws have changed. The implementation of those laws are still put in, in the position of people of power. Who are the people of power? People that have the means of production. And who are the people that own the means of production? Exactly. And so, so for me, it's about an entire system that is in place and, and it will obviously affect people, right? Well, the people that it affects the most, people right at the bottom of the pecking order happen to be black women. Um, and mm. yes, black men after that, but black women. So uh, the best way to actually explain that is, is in a, a way of an example. For instance, if we, for instance, look at BEE laws, all right? And people have uh, also this extreme visceral response to BEE laws, but when you look at um, who owns the means of production, how it's changed, have white people got poorer since BEE laws have come into place? No, they haven't. They've actually got richer. Yeah. Um, what has changed? Okay, but does that mean that, for instance, BEE laws are, are, negative, are bad? No, it means the application is bad. It means the application mm. is bad. I have walked into, I've told you, I'm in trading, okay? So I have walked into classes where 50-year-old black men that have work, worked for companies for 30 years, it's the first time they've ever been on training. And the only reason they're there is because that law requires you to train a certain amount of people. You get points for training people mm. that are people of color and black. Hectic. So white people have got all these tricks in place so, yeah, that further enable them. Yes. And who benefited most, for instance, from BE laws? White women. <laughs> so you all of a sudden saw... And which I don't think is a bad thing in a way is that, you know, being a white woman, <laughs> is that they actually, you started seeing them in management, which you didn't see prior to BE laws. So. Yeah. Wow, BE worked for white women. Initially, yes. But it, as it got stricter, it's now more of it. It's not working the way it used to. So white people are just wired to just... <laughs> <laughs> put themselves where the food is. Well, we've always had you. We've had years of practice, <laughs> so it's not mm. like it's new. It's not like it's new. Um, and I think people need to start waking up to the fact is that you don't have to be in government to actually have power in this country. You need to just own the resources. If you own the who, people focus on corruption, for instance, and when they're focusing on corruption, they focus on government. There would be no corruption in government if there was no one to partner with in corruption. So who is the partner in crime? The private sector. How many, how many times do you actually read about the private sector being corrupt? Very few times. And then what happens mm. is the focus is on one individual. If we look, for instance, the sign-off situation, who's the individual? We all know Marcus Yester. So, so everyone's focusing on Marcus Yoster, and there's an entire um, series of videos about mm. Marcus, Marcus Yoster, and all these very well-off, rich white men saying they didn't know, they didn't know. You know, this is a guy that didn't, he didn't, he responded to things on on an SMS, and you made deals with this guy. Now you want to tell me <laughs> you didn't know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a lot. You know, um, I was looking at um, the DA uh, campaigns and they've got a lot of white saviour complex. What rescue South Africa? Yes. Yes. So we've also got that problem where white people think that they're the answer and they can provide the leadership. Let's unpack that a little bit. Uh. I don't think it actually has changed very much. The problem is that they're starting to convince people that that's the truth, is that they will do better than, than the current government, okay? I think my, my problem is when I have conversations with black people and, and um, they say, yeah, no, they, they think it's time to give the Democratic Alliance a 
<laughs> Charles and I are the white lady in the room saying, what? <laughs> what in what on earth? And, and then you'll engage in the conversation. And the reason for that is, the reasoning behind that is that, you know, but where they govern, there's the clean audit. So they've, they've bought into that. There's the clean audits. There's the good governance. If the truth is that if you dig under this, a lot of corrupt governments, I mean, not corrupt governments, but corrupt organizations have had clean audits for years. And then all of a sudden it can't be clean anymore. Even audit companies have be, have been implicated in providing clean audits. Mm. I mean, so come on. You know, and unfortunately, I don't think w what happens with the Democratic Alliance is I do not think that they will actually grow. I think they have reached their, their ceiling. We'll have to see. They mm. might surprise us. Um, but they are selling this thing that it's such a mess. We have to do something about it. Mm. And they are well off. They've got the resources mm, behind it. Mm. The the media, and that that is something that I've also noticed. Okay, so I am very interested in anti-racism and I'm on my own anti-racism journey. And I clearly say I do not talk for anyone else except myself. Okay, so this is not speaking on behalf of, and I keep on reminding people that black people, Indian people, colored people don't need white people to speak on mm. their behalf. Mm. Okay. They don't need you to save them. Mm. They've had to do it for years. Mm. They, they've got this, promote mm. their voices, speak, mm. stay in your lane. Mm. All right. And mm. my lane happens to be mm. white, even though I get kicked out of it on occasion, mm. it's white. Um, but if we get back to, to the fact is that, um, with, with the democratic Alliance now is that they have sold this idea that they're the only ones that can fix it and they've done mm. it for years mm. okay they also from when they were developing when they they started i mean the the da was a mix of the national party the new national party um it was emerged the federal alliance and um the democratic party at that stage helen Sussman um at that mm. stage mm. and so when everyone comes back and says, yes, but the DA move, you know, the, the national party left them and they went to, um, to the ANC, the truth is, and I mean, you've got Helen Zilla on record saying, we know that the national party supporters will not follow Martinez von Skolkweg to the ANC. She's on record saying that. We also know that the people that were, you know, true to the national party, would have stayed within the Democratic Alliance. The, the National Party generally went to die, you know, the actual individuals in, in the ANC. They got a little bit of a thank you for coming, but then they kind of got absorbed. Whereas in the DA, they went into leadership. And people seem to ignore the fact that no, not everyone left with Martinez. And now as it starts going on, you start seeing their relationships with Afri Forum and you see which is a minority rights group, which is strange for a multiracial party, um, you know, and how they entertain certain ideas for way too long until it becomes a crisis, Cape Independence, yeah, which they finally have now put their, their foot down. Uh, the multi-party coalition, the Moonshot Pack group, uh, said they're not interested in Cape Independence, finally, yes. uh, uh, publicly. <laughs> Like, yeah, right. <laughs> publicly. Can't we arguably say that the DA is the government of South Africa? I've been thinking about that. Mm. I, I have been thinking about that because, you know, I, I've got a very clear view. If you're living in poverty in a country, it's because um, your government wants you to. Yeah. That's it. So yeah. because policy changes poverty. So if people in power are not making policies that are going to change policy, it's because they don't want to. Okay, that is my view. And people can say, no, that's not true. And But if you, for instance, look at different countries and you can look, for instance, at China, you can, they, in a short amount of time, lifted, five years time, lifted 800 million people out of poverty. Okay, 70 million, yeah. So, so 70 million of them, even higher than that. So 
if you look at China, Indonesia, India, India over 15 years was also a huge amount of people were lifted out of poverty from policy. And then if you don't even like those countries, you can go, you can go to the USA where people, uh, the more capitalist kind of people would like to go and watch. Uh, Social Security lifted a huge amount of people out of poverty. But there was a reason for that because they know old people vote. So that's why they, they actually did, you know, they did incentives for older people. Mm. Um, so if your country wants to lift you out of poverty, they would put policies in place that do so. So sure, it can. Yes. There's, it's, it's, there's cases where it's been done. And so what I am saying now is that even if I look at ran, land reform, um, which I've started looking up a lot mm. now and reading on existing cases, mm. I mean, there's people that have waited 12 years to get a response f with a land claim, to get a response from the department that uh, works with land, from our government for 12 years. And I, I can be very specific here. I'm talking about the Hilton College um, land, land claim. Yeah. What? Where one of the claimants has already died and the other is, um, I don't, I haven't kept track of the other. Oh my God. So, and so what does it tell you? You know, your... a government that's telling you, yeah, I'm, we're here for land. We're going to give you, <laughs> you know, we're going to sort out this land thing. These are land claims. We're not even talking about giving land to people that don't have land claims or, you know, we're not even talking about that. We're talking about official land claims. But then you get the sense that the people with the purse um, don't want that conversation on the table. And therefore, the ministers and the members of parliament <laughs> steer far away from that topic. Yes. But so how are we going to, you know, there's this uh, place I went to, Cape Vidal, right? Beautiful in St. Lucia. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful piece of land, white beaches. Like it's a secret spot that the white people have kind of... <laughs> <laughs> like I would, I, I was just like, "What is this? <laughs> what you know?" There's a secret spot. You There's see, I don't get invited yes, to places like this. And I was just like, "What's going on here, guys?" <laughs> and what they're doing now is that um, a cabin was two thousand rand to book out per night. Okay. And what? And that that is actually government land where this uh, resort is on. Okay. So it doesn't make sense that the locals have got no access to government land and white people are now capitalizing and economically excluding the locals. How are we going to deal with issues like that? Because that's, that's just, uh, that's playing out all over the country with all these guest houses, these hiking spots. Um, white people have hogged the land and they are benefiting from it economically, but there's a land act that happened and how do you know? Um, you know, I, I wish I could actually give you a solution to that. And I, I really can't. I would be, I, th I think I'd come across as a dictator. <laughs> it's just like, if you've got extra pockets of land, you've yeah. bought it from the municipality, show me. <laughs> okay, firstly, um, I, I would really be a dictator in, in situations like mm. that. There shouldn't be developments on, on government land that is not mm. going to be beneficial. Mm. for the community it it, it just doesn't right. make sense and that is not I'm, I'm not talking about here's your monthly stipend it should actually build on what we would call generational wealth that it is passed on from generation to generation because how are we going to catch up on that because that's you know when I um when we have a conversation and I often when I look at these conversations about you know um where black people uh are called racist by white people <laughs> okay um and there's a lot of back and forward and how you know I, where the black person says i can't be racist because mm. of this and mm. that, is i wish we could start getting to a stage where we could move from that conversation and talk about systemic issues you know but we can't because we we're, we're held in this continuous pushback mm. on this simple little thing around prejudice plus power 
you know, mm. and you can't get people to move on uh, on that. Mm. And I think a lot of these things are sideshows, which brings me back to what I wanted to say earlier mm. with the media and the Democratic Alliance. They throw us a bone every now and then. They say, oh, look, the Democratic Alliance is racist. Look at their leaders. OK, OK, fine. Um, thank you for no noticing that. However, rather show us a little bit deeper. Show us what their policies, how their policies will actually affect people. Show us how their fight against land reform will mm. affect people. Um, you know, cutting, for instance, they want to get rid of uh, my understanding is they want to, they don't want minimum wage. How's that going to affect someone that is cleaning a home, mm. for instance? That a domestic worker that mm. is now only getting her minimum wage, which is next to nothing. People that have to live on four, five or 5,000 rand a month. How is that going to affect? But they don't show us that. They just give us this, these highly emotive topics. Mm. And we keep on having these, you know, and they sidetrack us. And we, this is what we're looking at now. And it's, it's getting really frustrating. But yeah, uh, on the land issue, I, I would be much more dictated dictator orientated mm. um, and because I have seen things recently and I just take for instance something that happened in uh, Mossel Bay recently is where um, someone wanted to buy a piece of land a very rich man wanted to buy a piece of land he put in the application it wasn't for sale put in the application and um, it, the council, which was majority DA, started pushing it through. Thank goodness. And here's the thing. Here's the kicker. Freedom Front Plus, ACDP, and then PA and um, ANC pushed against it. But they couldn't do anything because they were outvoted. Okay. So they went to the public. They took it to the public. And then the public started mm. kicking against it. It was prime land, municipal land, right on the beach. What? Okay. But yeah, is that's not even the worst thing. When the media went to this guy, the, the man that wanted to buy this piece of land, he said he doesn't understand why there is such a big deal because his company has bought 69 pieces of municipal land. And I was like, say what? I read it over and over Whoa. again. Now, for him... You see, now where I am a little bit more astute and wouldn't have said that if I owned it because <laughs> he had no problem saying that he has this company that bought 69 pieces of municipal land. So the government One, is selling our land. Your councils are. So you've got to watch. at your, It's at council level. You know. So I don't know how these decisions are made or you know but it looks like at local governments that you know you've got a council that actually can decide i'm going to sell this pocket of land that's it you've put in an offer i'm going to sell this pocket of land the the system though is no different than what it used to be during apartheid is that you would find that people that were in the apartheid government and if you look at their family members they own lovely land at yes you can't they've got the most amazing properties at beaches and so it's no different your cousin would be buying you know this piece of pocket this pocket of municipal land you wouldn't you know so it would still white corruption it's just got a little bit of varnish um is your you wouldn't own it but it, and you'd say no but it's your cousin that has nothing to do with you and that was another thing <laughs> that was said <laughs> was the in this case this was a family member of a democratic alliance council member and he ex excused himself from the decision making process which i think is good mm. however in this meeting, the, the other Democratic Alliance um, representative says, yes, it is a family member, but it's a far family member. You read the article, the guy says, no, it's my cousin. How far? How far? <laughs> that means it's your brother's child. <laughs> <What's> like... <laughs> White people have got each other's backs, though, huh? We do. Through thick and thin corruption. We do. We do. Proper. <laughs> She's we laughing. Do. <laughs> we do. I can't. I can't defend. There's no no other because way. Because there's a lot of it, and the thing is that it looks like 
black people are corrupt, but it's actually white people who are corrupt in South Africa, <laughs> with all due respect. <laughs> like, even in the corporate staff, you'll find that the white management is uneducated. They're the ones stealing the money and stuff, but they get away with it because they're white. Yeah. It started, I've started seeing it now, though, is a lot of them are, you know, money is a big thing. So I've started seeing women now in the media that have defrauded their companies for years, millions of rands that they've defrauded. But then, then there's always a follow up. There's always, we've always got a cushion, okay? Because there was recently, and I can't think of her name now, someone that, yo, it was a huge amount of money. And I saw this article and it was very, how she had stolen millions. Yes. Okay, and had, she had surgery and she bought designer clothes and there were holidays and houses and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, but then I saw a follow-up article that highlighted what emotional trauma she had gone through. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, but I wonder if, for instance, let's say it was they for didn't, instance, a black woman dude, I... that did that. What would the next article be highlighting uh, her trauma that she went through as a child and that she lost her brother and, you know, to soften the... <laughs> Even the, the way, I mean, how do white people make sense of, like, remember the university student with the nafsis? Yes. Money and then the Rao uh, UJ lecturers who also ran away with money and how they got away with it and it was fine. Yeah. The standards are, are, are different. Um, mm. and, but that ties again to it's, it's the race to innocence for whiteness is that we, I mean, I do a, a whole segment that upsets people totally. So what I do is I highlight when there is crime committed violent crime committed against white people by white people and that riles people up terribly okay the the reaction to mm. it is like yeah but what about but what about mm. but no but you know about that i'm i'm showing you this mm. now okay i'm showing you this now so that we can eventually get into our minds that we have a problem for instance specifically with white women being the victims of crime, of violent crime when it comes to white men. Mm. And also white children mm. are, are actually struggling with it. Mm. Okay. And it's this total rush mm. to innocence that, you know, we can't, we've got the standard to maintain. We've sold this lie. We're not the same as the people that we have said were less than us. And now you come here and you are telling us, that we too can be violent and criminal and, you know, and that's not okay. And there is a visceral reaction to that kind of truth. And as, as I say, it's, it's the rush to innocence. It's that race. We've, we can't be seen this way. Shut this down, you know, um, and I see it continuously. Doesn't make me any less committed because I will continually do that until we understand that because I have a daughter. I want her to understand mm. that going through life thinking, oh no, this is a white guy, he's okay. <laughs> you know? I mean, I had, a, I had a white woman come onto my page the other day where, um, and she had just like, so I've got TikTok videos that was, was um, that deal with these kind of things, anti-racism mm. and my own journey, but also this kind of thing. I had a white woman come onto my page and actually make excuses for that white South African guy uh, in Alaska that killed the two Native American women mm. and filmed the one. And, and I was like, and she met, and then she told this whole story about how she locks her doors when she sees mm. black people approaching her car. And I was like, what? We're talking about this guy now. Is this the company that you keep? <laughs> and I was like, really? But it's that rush to innocence. And you put yourself at risk. You do. And I'm trying to get the message through is that, is that you're going to be putting yourself at risk. Also, it stands in the way, and, and that is my view. I think a lot of crimes committed in um, against white women, for instance, and I'm going to be specific, yeah, um, is they don't get solved immediately because you have this, the first narrative is black person did it. 
you know. So a whole lot of time is spent looking for this elusive, mm. violent black man. But in reality... But in reality, your elusive, violent black man happens to be the fiancé standing crying next to the coffin at her funeral. So... And you've, you as the parent of the child that you've lost welcome that man into your home and you are supporting him during that time. So, yeah, I think we need – I don't know how to do it. I haven't figured out a way yet on how to actually change people's minds because I just seem to be making people angry. <laughs> but I have started receiving a lot more private messages where people say mm. – I am what I am watching you. Mm. I appreciate what you're doing. Mm. Um, thank you, but I couldn't do that. Mm. I'm like, oh, come on, you can, you mm. can. <laughs> yeah, you know, it reminds me of um, there was this white dude. I don't know if you remember Peter House. He was also a, a, a white black people activist. Oh, um, and I remember that the community used to really alienate him, like the white people. So how do you deal with the emotional trauma of the rejection from your own people? Uh, I get asked that question quite often. Okay, I think the, the positive thing is that um, my own people were never actually based on race. Um, well, mm. when I say never, but as I matured and mm. my thinking changed, my own people were, were never tied to my race. It's people that I connect to intellectually and spiritually and, you know, we can have, we can debate things and totally disagree with each other. So so the people that have got this total, I hate you, you, you know, you're such a traitor, that kind of thing, they were never my people anyway. So it doesn't really bother me. People mm. believe that, I think that's also another thing is that there is this homogeneous group. No. I mean, if if you want to see how a um, group of white people act towards someone in their in-group that hasn't followed the rules, you know that that group's not homogeneous. I, I, for instance, follow Afrikaans media. As soon as I start seeing a white man on uh, getting negative press in in Afrikaans media for it, mm. I would say more in corporate or then I realize, okay, you've upset, mm. you've upset the mm. lager. So, so there's never really a solid group. I think it also makes you understand that you need, you sh and I wish people will understand they're not safe in that group. Mm. That's, that group doesn't care about them. You know, the people that, for instance, will fight hand, tooth and nail mm. against any reform in this country are people that actually own anything they don't they don't even have their own land or their own homes or anything like that they're people that ha haven't got savings in the bank for instance they they're people that would benefit from a larger social net so a social safety net mm. but they will fight against it because that's their only social capital knowing that they're a bit better than a black person you know or a colored person or Indian person who they're fighting for are the people that are right at the top, own everything, and don't care one bit about them. Wow, the irony. Exactly. So I see, for instance, so a little, uh, what I have been seeing now is the EFF is making inroads in poorer white communities. Okay, mm, so you've got, yes, so, yes. so you can immediately see these are at risk communities. And obviously, you know, with a class issue, which yes. is one of the, the EFF things, that it's about the working class, it's about the people that are marginalised. Um, and so they've started making inroads there. And I, have, you must see the absolute venom from white people towards those white people. You know, calling them prostitutes and drug addicts and, you know, all those kind of things. Instead of thinking, you know, why would... You know, interrogating it mm. and thinking, why would they mm. want a relationship with the EFF? Mm. Why, at, why, for instance, and, and why doesn't the DA, for instance, go and pick up those people? And why aren't those people at the DA rallies? Because they're just not cared about. They, they don't care about those people. So 
Um, so please never think that it's a homogeneous group because it's not. And also the people fighting hand, tooth and nail are people that don't own much. They haven't got pension funds. They haven't got um, savings in their banks. They don't own land, but they're fighting for the guy right at top to keep his 69 pieces of land. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Yeah, because that's the only the clever thing wife. he has. Yes, the clever whites. <laughs> yes, the clever whites. <laughs> because that's a, and but I don't blame them. As soon as I knew that it's the only social capital you have mm. is is to feel that, better is, than that's the only thing you've got. And in fact, there was a, a American president that that actually um, said it, and I'm, I, I can't quote him directly, but it, it comes down to convince the worst off white person that he is be better than the best off black person and you can empty his wallet. And it happens all the time. You've got the poorest of poor people saying, I'm going to take part of, I mean, I've seen it on Facebook, okay, where these right-wing groups that say, yo, we're fighting for your rights and for your freedom, um, where Someone will say in the comment section on Facebook, and they'll say it in Afrikaans, but I'll say it in English. Yeah. You know, I don't have much, but I'm just waiting for my grant. I'm going to give you 50 rand. And I'm like, you get a grant and you're going to give this person 50 rand out of your grant? I'm like, no. Wow. No. And the thing is, it's so deep. What you're saying is because we could fix this shit for everybody and everybody's being nice. We're all going to be living in proper housing. We're all going to have roads and parks and community centers for. Yeah. No, yeah. it's wild. Even, you know, um, the amount of money that the corporates are willing to spend on the political campaigns. Oh, yes. Instead of just. Oh, yes. I mean, if you look at the millions going into, for instance, these corporate compa campaigns and they're putting up I don't know, boards on the road. <laughs> I mean, you see this board and it's, what? We'll stop cadre deployment. And I'm like, no, you won't. But anyway, because you won't. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. They, they're tackling the wrong thing. But anyway, but they've masters of propaganda. So mm. we'll start believing. Eventually someone will say, yeah, makes sense. That's what they should be focusing on. But no, it's not what they should be focusing on. Um, but you see this big board and you think, that is an entire feeding scheme for a, for a school. That is an entire truckload of textbooks, a clinic, a, you know, all these kind of things. And you look at it and you just, you don't get it. You don't. But, but then again, um, we've got a short attention span. Mm. People buy into all these foofies. Mm. <laughs> Um, and the white master's aware of that. Of course. We, we, we've all got a short attention span. We're very short. What did the white people think of Pala Pala on a more real note? <laughs> I've, okay, so, so this white person, mm. okay, found the whole story so confusing. Okay. I was, I was so confused. <laughs> I, didn't, I was like... In a couch. <laughs> and then, what and then I was like, how much? <laughs> Bull? <laughs> and then the story, so, so, so it was just all over for me. And there was just so much that I just eventually thought, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> so, so, and, and, you know, and I, I, do I think that something like that should be investigated? Absolutely. But, but there's so much noise mm. that you, you, I couldn't find exactly what I was supposed mm. to be looking for. And I eventually just gave up. Um, but I saw, which again makes me question, you know, who is our president? Mm, <laughs> mm, mm. Um, and I, I still remember, oh my goodness, you know, just before um, President Ramaphosa came in, I was on the radio, I phoned into a radio show and they said, what did you think about, what do you think about President Ramaphosa becoming mm. uh, president? Okay. And I was like. Yes, I think it would be good to have him this, as the CEO. Of the <laughs> mm. and, and that was my view at that stage. I think he's, 
likeable. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have questions around the fact that there's so little progress, that there's no consequences, that, you know, this particular thing is just like swept under mm. the carpet. You know, there's no clear indication of what, what are the consequences for this particular issue where your president has done something like this. Yeah. Where there is this cash. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, I assume, taxable. Right. Yeah. And, and you're not allowed to have that you're not allowed to have that much money in your house without declaring. Yeah, but that whole story was so confusing for me. Yeah. It was just like but white people in general didn't give him much attention. Because I asked you that because white people seem to have a, a, a common narrative. Like it's like you guys are like <laughs> right. This is we've decided we're gonna take down Zuma today. Guys, let's go. Grannies, children, everybody, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like cheerleading squad, you know? There's this thing, there's this organizational thing of white people, right? Yeah, we, we, we kind of just work. You know, yeah. It's, it's kind of, so I said you the were voices organized that, about Pala Pala there. <laughs> The voices that matter will be heard. And also, we'll, it also helps that we've got media behind us. Yes. You know, that, yes, that kind of, yes. Uh, we should probably clarify when we talk about white people. We're talking about the powers that be. The system. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, so, so there's this narrative and that's what you'll read. And I read mainstream media and I also read independent media. Yeah. Um, so that I can generally gauge mm, um, where, the where, truth is. where the truth is. And I must say both are flawed. Let's, let's be fair. Mm. Um, you know, because I think at a stage, independent media thought, no, now we're going to fight you on the same grounds. We're going to start pushing things. But, mm. and, and then some of them lose credibility. Mm. You're like, no, man, that's not true. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. so, but, but yeah, so, so we've generally got a, I would say a very, it looks like a uniform approach. And are you, you are aware that there's no black media, huh? Even when you say uh, independent media. Yeah, no, no. I, I didn't There's say no, black media. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I didn't. Um, I was hoping at a stage that this would have changed, you know, that a more, how can I say, I, it's not even, I was hoping that at a stage we, we could get to a stage where we would have a media that addresses class. Okay, mm. you've currently got mm. media that addresses the middle class and mm. Mm. those are people and that can oligarchs. afford, yes, mm. people that can afford to buy those, mm. um, those kind of ops, mm. op-eds, and, but people that can afford to pay to read it too. So, so you've got the 20% of people that can actually afford to pay to read it and they get the message out and then yeah. everyone that can't afford to pay to read it will then follow that message mm. and so that's how the narrative mm. is is actually structured but i was hoping at a stage we'd get something um where you would actually have something for you know people that are not middle class mm. that can address real mm -hmm. issues like mm -hmm. you know if you have a protest what was it really mm. about so i'm not only seeing this protest of someone burning tires i'm seeing Someone saying, listen, we've struggled to do this. This is the actions we've taken. But mm. no one goes into the human stories. No, that, that goes against what Rupert's, because it's Rupert's media, basically. So what happens is that a black media company will prop up and instead of a Rupert developing that one without wanting some, Rupert will just mimic what that small media company is doing on ENCA or, you know, mm. so it's still very much driven by profits. And so our, our problem is the oligarchs. Mm. Mm. It's actually not in the end. We realize it's not the politicians. It's not the white people. It's actually specifically these families. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there's not much you can do it. Well, or what you can do is start something. And that, that's something that I, I was actually looking at is how people did it previously when they had absolutely no money. How did they do it? How did they put together pieces? They wrote pieces. They mobilized people through. Yeah. You know, I heard a story the other day of where a, 
man used to walk 10 kilometers to go and read the newspaper that was like this newspaper that wasn't distributed to mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. that was you know for for like activists you should like go and, and go or... yes mm -hmm. and i read that and i how do you do that you know because there wasn't money to actually you know no one was funding these kind of things they were scraping it together in communities but it was community stories and and that is something that i miss mm -hmm. that I, that i miss in the entire media setup yeah so so yeah i know there is no black media but i was hoping that we would get to a stage where mm -hmm. we would have you know the, the people that are at risk are covered people that are mm. you know i don't just see a photo of someone burning a tire and say oh look they're protesting again mm. why for what reason mm. what's happening i wonder how we can get the whole integration yes. thing right um i even feel like whites need to go for cultural training of you know <laughs> they they there's you you by at this stage should be able to speak in an indigenous language you know we, we should, should know you know what i'm saying we should be so there are things that need to be put in place for so that you, white people are better um counterparts uh, yeah but I, I can tell you that we'd need a much stronger government to put things in place. I'll give mm. you an example that available now is mm. this um, education amendment. So it's it's the bill that is looking at the act from 96 mm. on the Education Act. Mm. One of the areas that it addresses is language. Okay. And the idea is to introduce resources into certain schools so that they can offer languages, they can offer, for instance, classes in Zulu. Mm. Okay. All right, which means that if you are seen as an appropriate school to offer, then the education department would offer you resources and Zulu children would attend your Afrikaans school. Mm. What do you think is, how long do you think they've been trying to get this bill through? Mm. Who do you think is financing every mm. single kick against integration? Mm. I know it's that race again. Under the and and what are they doing? Mm. They are saying yes, it's to get rid of Afrikaans. It's to burden Afrikaans mm. schools. It's and I mean there's and and they're very clear. Uh, solidarity, which is like a. I like to think of it as if you know anything about the Bruder Bond, mm. okay? So this mm. this little society that I know had its Bruder tentacles mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Look at Solidarity; it's got its tentacles everywhere. It's it's built with Afri mm. Forum. Afri Forum is a subsection of Solidarity. It's got its own union, all those kind of things. Now these things existed, and they can exist. That's perfectly fine. How? I mean, in fact, it's a model that should be copied. I would, I would actually copy but that But for model. everybody. But for everyone. Yes, right. exactly. Hey, your people. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and solidarity has indicated they would take the government to, to court. So they'll tie them up for another year, few years about the bill. And if you, and what I did is I actually read the 96 Act and I read the bill. A lot of the stuff that is spread in the media is totally false. You've got other mm. politicians saying, oh, but now what about homeschooling? It hasn't really changed. Nothing's really changed. What about religion? Nothing's really changed. The major issue is the language. So you've got black people and colored people fighting on behalf, <laughs> fighting against integration. This is wild. And on that note, Miss B. Yes. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. <laughs> I know we could speak about your passion all day. Absolutely. Thank you and we wish oh, you the you. best. And thank you for all the hard work you put in. Oh, ne? no problem. <laughs> thank you so much. Moya right. well, there you have it. I'll see you guys next time. Please remember to like, share and subscribe. And remember the details are on screen right now. Love and light. Who are you when all you were has been diluted by lies and white lines cancelling out all that which has been written of your history? Why do you look at yourself as a mystery? Doesn't the sun shine because you open your eyes? Doesn't the moon stay situated within the same stars your DNA sparkles off?
your spirit knows that surely corner into a off buza umoya so you may return to being well off because spiritually you are rich yet your ancestors cry because you are out of reach but yours is to command all elements while god takes inspiration from the very mirror she looked at to become remember who you are and never finish just when they think that with you they are done